a lovely day to be all together on Family First. Um, I love that video. With all we are, with all our breath, we will worship the Lord together. And I know most of you feel the same way about me, but we have an awesome family here. Um, but we have one true family, the family of God, that we get to worship today. So if you'll stand with us.
seated. Yeah, don't stand on my account, believe me. Good morning. What a beautiful day to worship God, isn't it? Yeah, really appreciate the worship this morning. Uh, just a couple quick announcements that we have. Uh, a men's uh, meeting is tonight, the men's Bible study. We're meeting at six o'clock back there. If you're one of the leaders, I know we've been meeting at five, but I think tonight we'll just uh, meet at 5.30, okay? So you don't need to come at five if you're one of the leaders, just come at 5.30. But that's tonight uh, for everybody else at six o'clock. And then next Saturday on uh, April 9th at, at 8 a.m. to noon, we are having a church work day all, uh, at the, here to get ready for Easter. We'll have just some cleaning type stuff for people to do and maybe some light uh, fixing or maintenance type things to do around here. But uh, everyone is welcome to come and help out and just uh, spruce our church up and get it ready for all the visitors that we're going to have on Easter Sunday. If you're visiting us here today, I just want to thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Uh, in your bulletin, you'll see a tear-off slip like this, and uh, I would just encourage you to fill this out. And after the service is over today, if you would take it back to the visitor center by the coffee bar, we have a, a special gift for you uh, this, this day. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for this time that we have to come together and worship you and that we can do this in freedom. And uh, we don't have to worry about war going on or anything like that, as so many other uh, parts of the world do. And uh, we, we just pray your Holy Spirit would meet with us now and just give us a passion in our hearts for you and bless us. Just lift our hearts up to in praise and worship unto you. And we just thank you that you're always there, even as we sang this morning with your arms open just waiting for us to come to you no matter how we've strayed, no matter what we've done. Your love will never fail, and you're always there for us. And we just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. This we lift up in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Um, if you'll stand, let's continue worship. Um, we've got such beautiful song to remind us of Jesus, the Son of God, and then our own time of testimony where we need him every hour. Down from heaven's throne, this 
set you for what's not your home and above like this the world had never known a crown of thorns to mock your name forgiveness fell upon your Thank you. 
Pastor Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much, folks. What, I need you every hour, and uh, we do need the Lord every, uh, every hour of our life. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, folks. Um, uh, Irene Smith, longtime member of our church. Her and her husband, Ken, led a Bible class here in the auditorium called the Victory Class for years. And uh, Irene went to be with uh, the Lord um, uh, yesterday. And so pray for the family. Jessica, who helps us with our music, this is her grandma. And uh, so pray for the family. And um, uh, she, uh, she had suffered, with some, obviously, with some health issues for some time. And she had fallen asleep at some point and woke up in heaven. And isn't that the way, it, isn't that kind of a fun thing to envision? And uh, I'm sure that uh, besides the Lord, first, maybe the first person she saw was her husband. And uh, he'd been, he's been gone for a while, so that was a, that's a blessing. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bible to Hebrews, all right? We're gonna, I'm going to do a little review from last week, Hebrews 1, and then we'll jump into the first few verses of Hebrews 2 as well. There was a problem in the first century, all right? This problem is people came to Christ, they began to follow Christ. Uh, most of them, of course, were, were Jews at the beginning. Mo- the church was mostly Jews at the very beginning, and then the gospel spilled over into the Gentile world to the non-Jews. They, the Bible sometimes calls them the Greeks. Um, and, uh, and I'm just reminded that the gospel knows no boundary, racial boundary, geographical boundary, generational boundary. The gospel knows none of those things. Aren't you glad for that? And, uh, and here we are, uh, 20 centuries later, and following Jesus Christ just like they did in the first century. But the problem was, so many of these people who were, were, uh, Jew, and grew up in Judaism, they now were confronted that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, and they turned to Christ. They were following after Christ. And then there was persecution that would come their way. There were people that would, uh, that would say, well, if you're a follower of Jesus, then I can't have anything to do with you. They lost friends. Uh, they were estranged from family members. Some of them lost jobs. Some were forced to move away. And with this kind of persecution, many of the Jews said, I'm not sure this is worth it. I'm not sure following Jesus is really worth it. Surely I can just go back to Judaism. And thus we have this book of Hebrews written to the people that were tempted to to renounce their faith in Christ and to to follow Judaism away. And uh, uh, Judaism again, I should say. So the writer here of Hebrews points to the importance of living with eternal values and in, in focus, not just temporal things as well. And uh, the whole book of, of Hebrews, really, Jesus is better. That's what we talked about last, last week. Jesus is better. And it's a better way to live, to follow after Christ. And Christ today is a better messenger. We, we, have, uh, we have all of these things that we're going to talk about today. Here's the issue. Today, in this century, in this generation, uh, the Bible predicts a widespread spiritual crisis. Um, it's amazing how we'll read the Bible, and it was written, you know, all these years ago, and now we're seeing these things just come to pass right before our eyes. It's kind of an amazing thing. <clears throat> the Bible predicts a widespread spiritual crisis. I want to show you some things on the screen, some verses. Show you four verses that just talk about this. First of all, from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1, says this, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. Some, some people who were kind of followers of Christ, they were in their Bible, they were praying, they were meeting with other Christians, then all of a sudden they just kind of walk away from that. And, they, and, and there's an old term that preachers used to use way back in the day, they're backsliders, okay? And, uh, and the scripture says, you know what, in the latter times, right before the coming of the Lord, right before the rapture, this is what's going to happen. Some will depart from the faith. Notice this verse, that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Now, if I read something in one place in the Bible, of course I'm going to take it serious, but if it's in two different spots in the Bible, then I know that God really means this, and this is something for us to, con- uh, to consider. But look at this in Mark chapter 13, verse number 22. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up. By the way, if you don't think that that's happening, you can just go to YouTube and uh, you, can, you can see all kind of religious nutcases out there that are, that are somehow claiming, oh, I'm really truly the Messiah. And, uh, 
And, uh, and it's just a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a strange thing, and people follow after them. So false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen people, even Christians, even those that have, are, have given themselves over to the Lord, they also will uh, uh, be deceived by this as well. And then in Revelation chapter 2, we have this situation where the writer of Revelation, John, John the Revelator, this is the same Apostle John that walked with Jesus Christ. And when he's an old man, he gets this revelation from God, okay? And, uh, and, and John's talking to these seven churches, and these churches represent the attitudes of people. And some scholars even think that, uh, that the words that we'll see here in, in uh, chapter 2 uh, are words that were written to the latter-day church. And it says this, I know all the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. And what the Scripture is saying, some people are followers of Christ, but they're so cold in their faith. And, uh, and, or they're just lukewarm in their faith. They're drifting away from the truth and, and drifting away from the, from, uh, from the Lord. And John uh, and Christ told this church, says, man, I, I, wished you, I wished you'd get heated back up. I wished you'd come and, and come back to me. So the answer to this drift, the answer to this backsliding is found in the book of Hebrews. Some may think this, I put this in the notes, some may think this is just a pep talk. You know, kind of like a coach gets his, his team together at halftime and just kind of ramps them up. All right, guys, we can do better. And some may think, well, that's all that the people need. Some may think, well, uh, let's just give everybody some practical humanistic steps. And uh, let's do these steps of action. And, uh, and that's, that's really what people need so they won't drift away. Maybe just an encouragement to fight. You know, just kind of get up and let's fight the devil and let's fight against that. And, and, uh, or even hey, that's just run and hide. I've, I've had people tell me this. Wouldn't it be great if all the Christians in the United States just moved to one state and we just live in that state? And, uh, you know, and, and I want to follow the sentence for them and just let everybody go straight to Hades, you know. And, uh, but that's all kind of clunk, clunk together, and, and that's not God's plan. That's not what God wants, by the way. And, uh, and so some people maybe think, well, that's what we really have. Let me just tell you this, all right, very clearly, and this will be on the screen, the answer to drifting, the answer to backsliding, this is what the book of Hebrews tells us, is purely doctrinal. Uh, you know, we don't really spend a lot of time in church teaching doctrine much anymore. It's usually how-to, you know, practical how-tos of overcoming anxieties and worries and, you know, and these kind of things. Maybe uh, help us with our family. Those things are good and important. But, you know, for crying out loud, where else are you going to learn doctrine? We come to church, we find out about the Lord. I've, I've said this on many occasions. Most of the preaching today in our country is human-centered. We are preaching about human things. And a hundred years ago, most of the preaching was God-centered. We were learning about God and who He was and what He could do. And so the answer to this in the book of Hebrews, it's all doctrinal. If we would get a clear understanding of our Savior and a clear understanding of our King and who He is and what He's done for us, then that, that will keep us from drifting away from the faith. And so we, uh, we get the theology of Jesus here in the book of Hebrews. Um, in fact, what I want to do is I want to show you a verse that we looked at last week, and I put it in the paraphrase here uh, in the new NLT, and I want you to look at this, and i got some thoughts that I want to share with you. I told you last week you ought to underline this or write it out on a, on a card or something, because in one verse we have such a powerfully packed theology of Jesus Christ. Look at this. The sun radiates God's own glory, and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he has cleansed us from our sins, he sat down at the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. What a wonderful verse this is. And I want to share five thoughts with you from this verse that I think will help us on the back side of the notes. First of all, Jesus broadcasted the glory of God. Well, let's put it this way. Uh, in old buildings, a lot of times, they would have a big uh, boiler somewhere, usually off in, like the, in, a, in a basement or something like that, and there would be pipes from that boiler, and there would be radiators in the rooms, and the radiators would then take the hot water, and, uh, and the fins of those radiators or, or whatever would then heat up the air in the room. 
And, uh, and in a sense, Jesus was the radiator of God's boiler. He radiated the glory of God, the heat of God, as, as, as we might say. And of all the things that point us to, uh, to, the, to God the Father, the creation and, and all of the things, it is Jesus Christ himself that is the chief radiator, the broadcaster of God's glory. Secondly, Jesus had the engraved markings of God's character. Okay, I got a little coin here. I know you can't see it, and it wouldn't matter. You probably don't, can't tell if this is a nickel, a dime, or a quarter. It's a dime. It's just so small. And I, uh, I collect coins a little bit. I have a collection worth $49, and I'm pretty proud of that, okay? And, um, but this, and, and this little coin, it has the word liberty engraved. It has Franklin D. Roosevelt's head engraved in this, has the date. It also has a mint marking on the back as a pretty design, says United States of America as one of the things that it says. And we have this, uh, I know it's a dime because of the engraving markings uh, that the mint put in this coin. And the mint says, the United States government says that this is worth something. You can't do a lot with a dime anymore, can you? Uh, you there was a day you could make a phone call with this thing or buy even a little bit of candy. Once in a while, you, can, you probably can get something with a dime, but you have several dimes you can do something with it. And it's the engraved markings. Notice on the screen, Jesus had the engraved markings of God's character. This, by the way, this, uh, this coin could be uh, uh, smacked around, it could be marked and, and, and all this, but it would still have the engraved markings of a dime. Men took Jesus Christ and smacked him around and bruised him up and punctured him and nailed him to a cross, but he still had the engraved markings of God himself. And he does even to this very day. I might mention that later on as well. Third, we see this from this verse, that the universe is sustained by the power of his word. Um, uh, this verse tells us that very clearly, that uh, at, at his command, at the power of his command, at the power of his, of his spoken word, everything is sustained. Now, you know, the words of Jesus really meant something. Somebody came to Christ one day and said, Christ, I need you to heal a family member, and I, and I believe you can do this so much that if you just say the word, you don't even have to come to, to my house. If you just say the word, I know my family member will be healed. And, and Jesus looked at the crowd and he says, I haven't seen such great faith in all of Israel. And uh, what an amazing thing, the power of God's word. He sustains it all uh, as well. Jesus is the only one that could completely purify us. This verse lets us know that we are cleansed from our sins. And in the original Greek, the word is literally purified, completely purified by the Lord Jesus Christ. There were other people that died on the cross. But they didn't have the power to cleanse us from our sins. There were other people that even were believers who died a martyr's death. But their, but their death didn't mean that anybody would be purified. When Jesus went to the cross and died for us, it cleansed us from our sins. And we were completely uh, cleansed, completely cleansed with, uh, by the power of the Lord. And he's the only one that could do that. And now, of course, he sits at the right hand, a place of honor, the right hand next to the Father. We did talk about that last week some, and this verse brings it out. Christ is there. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's the foreman of this construction in heaven. He said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. He sits at the Father's uh, right hand, a place of influence. He's talking to the Father many times on our behalf, praying to the Father on our behalf. And, uh, and the Scripture teaches this as, uh, as well. So with all of those things said about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I want you to go to chapter 2 in your Bible, and let's look at the first few verses together. Verse number 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. This is a great little verse that... Uh, uh, it's, that be, it's the beginning of this chapter, and it starts out with this word in the New King James, and the King James as well, this word, therefore. Let me just say this. When you're reading your Bible and you come across the word therefore, this is what I learned way, way back. Uh, you ask yourself this question. Why, what is that word therefore? Okay, if you see the word therefore. Literally what it means is this. Action is required. When you see the word therefore, no action is required. The first chapter was given to us is doctrinal, and then you have this word, therefore, because of the doctrine, now you have to act on it. So kind of just make a little note. When you see that word in your Bible, uh, therefore, action required. So 
I looked at this uh, uh, verse number one, and as and we look at this, we see that Jesus begins to explain what we're to do with the information that we got in, in chapter one. By the way, we live with this all the time in our life. Uh, you drive down the road, there is a sign that gives you information about the speed limit, okay? And that doctrine should dictate what you do. You see the sign and it says 70 from here to Wichita. That side, speed limit, 70. Therefore, I need to back off a little bit. Therefore, I need to use my cruise control. Therefore, I'm not going to go 90 or I'm in trouble. Okay, Pam has tried this before and believe me, we're just in, we're in trouble. I've done a little personal work with the officers on the side of the road, just <laughs> give them my testimony, talk to them about the goodness of the Lord. That didn't help. So therefore, we have doctrine, we have instruction, let's do something about it. Um, so we're going to see a warning, a command and a warning in, in this passage, in these first few verses. And the warning here, verse number one, lest you drift away. The writer of Hebrews tells the people, tells us, listen, there, here, there's, a, there's a problem here. There's, this is a warning to you. If you don't do it, we say, you're going to drift away slowly from, from, the, uh, from the faith, from the truth. And the farther you get away from the truth, the more difficult it will be for you in your Christian life. <clears throat> it's been a few times and I don't know what spell of insanity I was under, but there was a few times that I went up into the mountains of Colorado and floated on, uh, uh, you know, on these rafts uh, down, the, down the river. And uh, did that with the youth group back in the day. Um, and uh, good night, this, this would have been 20 years ago. And um, Gary Ridge was our youth pastor at the time, and they had a float trip uh, connected to our camp. And and uh, we hit a rock, and, and we had this big kid in the youth group, uh, John Ross Hofer, if, if you remember him. He's a big guy, and he was bouncing out of, the, out of the raft, and it just freaked me out. I thought, he, you know, so I, I grab him by the, uh, by the vest, and, his, you know, adrenaline takes over and just yanked him right back into the, into the boat. It was all truly adrenaline, and, uh, and once I yanked him back in the boat, he just looked at me and goes, whoa. You know, I mean, he was, he was probably like a 6'3", I don't I want to guess his weight, but it was, he was a big guy. And uh, I jerked him back in there, and I said, don't you forget it, you know. <laughs> and uh, one time I was floating down, and, I, and, and the river was narrow and it was pretty fast. And at the end of the float trip, the, the river just broadens way out, like a half mile wide. And... Uh, and, and, and you're supposed to, you know, paddle on over. And, of course, our boat was all guys, and there was another boat of girls. And, and so what do you do? You take the bucket, and you just start flipping water at them, okay? Um, now, we've been in a river for, like, three hours. We're all soaking wet, but somehow this is a big insult to take a bucket of water and throw it at them. They're throwing back at us. We go back and forth. And I even jumped out of the boat. Now, it's, it's, it's not the rapids anymore. It's a big, wide thing. And, uh, and I'm splashing water, and we're supposed to be heading to the shore. And I uh, realized that I had drifted to the far side of the river trying to mess with that, you know, thing of girls. And, and now I had to swim across stream to get back to the shore. And I uh, didn't realize just how strong that current was. And I fought against that and swam as hard as I could for quite some time and just to the point of exhaustion. What I'm saying is it's easy to drift if you're not paying attention. This verse tells us there's a, there's a command and a warning. I'm going to the warning first. Be careful because you don't want to just drift away. And it's easy to drift away from the things of God. It's easy not to pick up your Bible and read it. It's easy not to spend some time in prayer. It's easy just to quit, you know, finding yourself with other Christians in Bible study in a small group or Sunday school or even church service. It's easy just to drift away from the things that you're supposed to hold on to. Look back at verse number one because I kind of skipped over this. You saw the warning, notice that you drift away. What we're supposed to do is give more earnest heed um, to the things that we have heard. That's our command. Uh, let's put it in the notes this way, all right? The command is P 
pay the most careful attention to the things of God. I put it in the notes this way. This isn't a casual glance or a passing notice. When I was in college, it was just ridiculous. Um, we had some, some 730 classes, and, um, and we were up till all hours goofing around. Uh, I, I should say this way. The dorm guys were goofing around. I was in my room studying, of course, and, um, and sometimes that would go till 1 o'clock or later in the morning, and then it was hard to get up get ready for class. And, uh, and a lot of times we would set our alarm, me and my, my roommates, we would set our alarm for, seriously, I, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't even admit this to you, but we would set our alarm for 7.15 and, um, and jump up, get ready, because it was a five-minute walk, we would get ready, just pull on our clothes and, and, and whatever, and I remember more than once, I would get myself ready and I'd look at my roommates and I'd go, well, how do I look? And they'd, and, and they'd hardly even look at me and go, well, you look great. How do I look? And I'd say, you look fine, let's go. And hair would be messed and, of course, we'd buzz it down all that back in the day because you just didn't want to mess with anything. And, uh, and it, was just, it was ridiculous until you could always tell when one guy fell in love because he was not getting ready like that. Um, he was in the bathroom, looking in the mirror, taking care of everything, okay? And that was, I knew, when Pam and I met, I knew I was dead meat when I began, what's Pam going to think if she looks at me like this? And I had, you know, kind of worked on myself a little bit. It's easy um, to just kind of give yourself a casual glance, all right? I don't want you to do that spiritually, like what I did physically. Um, okay. A few years ago, driving down the road, minding my own business, Pam's sitting there, we're talking about stuff, whatever, and as we pull into the house, into the garage, she says, you go to the bathroom right now. I go, oh, no. So we go in there, and, and apparently, when I turned 50 or so, the eyebrow hairs begin to grow twice as fast as every other hair on my body. And I didn't notice this, because it's st still... A little bit of a casual glance, you know. Um, <laughs> so Pam takes these scissors and tweezers, and she's yanking stuff and cutting stuff. And my nose is running because it's really painful. <laughs> I'm pr am I the only guy that's gone through this? <laughs> okay. I mean, these things are, you know, sticking straight out, and Pam's trying to mow them down and, and pluck them out. And I'm just, uh, I'm in pain and agony. And, uh, all right, I, I'm sorry to admit this, but when I was looking in the mirror, it was a casual glance. When Pam looked at me, it was a careful scrutinization. <laughs> and she didn't like what she saw, because these things were out of control. I'm not just preaching, I'm telling the truth, right, dear? <laughs> She's denying her involvement in this story. I'm surprised blood wasn't dripping out of my eyebrows. It was, it was that bad. And what verse number one says, that's give careful heed. The casual glance doesn't work. The passing notice doesn't work of your spiritual life. This denotes an intentional, write it down, an intentional and careful scrutinization. And then the warning. If you don't do this, you're going to drift away. If you put your spiritual life on autopilot, don't pay any attention to it, you just, you're just going to drift away. This is one of the reasons why I ask you to come regularly to a Bible study, Sunday school, church service, watch something on YouTube, something good and solid, um, because what we're doing is we're being challenged to examine ourselves in light of the scripture. Does this make sense? Hope it does to you. Verse number one talks about this drift away. We don't want to drift away. When I read that, I got to thinking about this verse in Hebrews chapter 6. We'll show it on the screen. Notice, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. What keeps a boat from drifting? It's the anchor. Hey, you see, I, I, maybe I should have thrown some pictures up there for you. Um, 
everybody's, you know, if you've gone on a little fishing boat, the anchor's just kind of small, but it, that thing lands at the bottom of the lake, and, and it, but it will keep you from drifting. Um, the big uh, sea liners, you know, um, uh, cruise ships, and whatnot, they have these huge anchors, sometimes 10, 12, 15, 20 feet, you know, and, 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 the, and the chains on those things, just massive. And I go down to the bottom of the ocean, and it keeps that ship from drifting. What's, what is the anchor for our spiritual life? There's a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. All right? In the Old Testament, in that, in that tabernacle, there would be this place. There would be, it didn't have walls, it had curtains. It was a mobile temple. And, uh, and so they would have uh, uh, this, this holy place. And they would have a curtain, and the priest would come into the holy place. There would be these, uh, uh, some furniture there uh, for the priest to work with. And then there was another veil, another curtain. And on the other side of that curtain was the Holy of Holies. Um, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. The lid of the Ark of the Covenant was called the mercy seat. The high priest would go in there once a year and would make a sacrifice and pour blood on top of that lid, on top of the mercy seat. And the Bible tells us that the glory of God would actually come and shine there in the Holy of Holies. And the priest would make that sacrifice uh, for the people. Now the Scripture tells us that Jesus is the one that has gone into the Holy of Holies on our behalf. The book of Hebrews will tell us once and for all. He only did it, do it once. The priest had to do it every year. And he went into the inner sanctuary as our high priest and presented the sacrifice for us so that we could get saved. Uh, let me tell you this. Uh, just popped in my head. Uh, has for a, a few days. I've been thinking about this. In the book of Revelation. Okay, remember John, who grew. He, you know, he, he he was with Christ as as a young man, and now he's an old man. He's grown old. He's probably like ninety years old, and he gets this vision. He gets this revelation from God, and he writes it down for us. It's our book of Revelation. And in this, in this vision, John, and, it's, and I, it's more than a dream, it was a revelation. John is now in heaven, in this, in this and, and he's writing down what he sees. And on the throne sits God the Father. And God the Father's got this scroll in his hand. And John, I don't know how he knows it, but he knows it, that this scroll is the proclamation of our salvation and it's sealed you know it was I, I just always think of these wax seals but maybe maybe rings or something seven seals around this scroll and this real big strong angel comes up and says who is worthy to open this scroll and to announce the official proclamation of our salvation and the angel says there's nobody here to do that. There's no one in heaven. There's no one on earth. And there's no one under the earth. And John begins to weep. In fact, it's been my unfortunate, I would say, duty sometimes to inform people their loved one has died. And sometimes the emotion comes forth and it's just wrenching. And that's how I feel John was. He just weeps when he realizes no one is worthy to open the scroll. And all of a sudden, here comes the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And Christ grabs the scroll from the Father and rips it open. And the proclamation of our salvation is shared with us. By the way, all of heaven falls to their knees and they begin to sing a new song. We, we sing the Revelation song. They're singing the real Revelation song. And they sing, Holy, holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty. 
and worthy is the Lamb. By the way, I'll get a little Easter on you here for a second. As the Lamb of God comes to open that scroll, the Scripture tells us it was like a lamb already sacrificed. Now, can you envision this with me? Jesus Christ with the scars on His head, the nail prints in His hands and feet, the wound in His side. And you say, well, surely that's been healed up. I don't think so. When Mary Magdalene came across Jesus, He said, don't touch me. I haven't presented myself to the Father. Then he goes to the Father. He comes back a week later, and he sees the apostles, including Thomas. And Thomas says, I won't believe unless I see the nail prints. Jesus has already been to heaven, presented himself to the Father, and Thomas saw the nail prints and put his hand in the wound in the side. I think the wounds are still there. A little Easter message for us already. And the people just will shout, we will do it too, and sing to the Lord, and sing about the Father, and sing about the Son, and sing about the Holy Spirit, because the Son is the one that went into the presence of the Lord and presented the offering for our sins, and we've been cleansed. He went into the inner sanctuary of God. Not the Holy of Holies in the temple, He went right into the presence of God presented himself as the sacrifice, and then read the official proclamation that we have been saved. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Aren't we grateful for that? i got to hustle along here. Um, So verse number 1 of chapter 2, unless we drift away. Verse number 2, For if the word spoken through the angels proved steadfast. By the way, in the Old Testament, up until this time, when an angel or a heavenly being said something, the people had to pay attention. And if they ignored the message from heaven, they would be judged. They would have, there would be consequences. So the Scripture says, look, even the angels when they said things and, and gave messages, it proved to be right, proved to be steadfast. And every transgression and obedience, disobedience received a just reward. And then in verse number 3, well, how shall we escape if we neglect the salvation? Not just our own personal salvation, but how do we escape if we neglect Christ? If we neglect the salvation that was made for, um, by Jesus Christ for our sins, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him. Um, by the way, the Lord Himself confirmed the fact that His sacrifice was good for us and His sacrifice mattered. And there's also another confirmation. We'll talk about that just in a second. I want to just point this out to you in the notes that Jesus is the better messenger. Um, Verses 2 and 3, we've we've just read these verses. Throughout the entire Bible, people were blessed or judged by their reaction to the things that the Lord had had commanded, even through angels and their messengers, or their their messages. Um, Certainly we'll face consequences if we neglect our great Savior. And uh, notice this verse from 1 Samuel chapter 15. It's important. I think it's good for us that we came and we gathered together today and we worshiped, we sang. I was blessed by the songs. I hope you were blessed by the songs. It's one thing to come worship, but notice what really gets the importance or gets the attention of God. Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. I don't know about you, but I want to give the Lord great delight by my life. Um, And it's one thing to pray. It's another thing to worship. It's another thing to come to church and give your offering. All of those are expressions of offerings and sacrifices. But if you really want the Lord's blessings in your life, if you really want the attention of God, if you really want to put a smile on God's face, then obey Him. Obey what the Scripture says. It's what the the Scripture is letting us know here. So the Gospel is confirmed by the witnesses um, to Jesus. Um, And... uh, Notice, if you will, verse 4. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles. Let me just stop. You you can get out this this afternoon, take a drive through the countryside, and you can see what God has done. You can drive up into the mountains of Colorado. You can go down into the hills of... uh, uh, You can go down to the hills of of southeast Kansas, and you can just see how God put this all together. Um, You can go to the ocean side, and, and... and the ecosystem, how it all just fits and works together. And you just think, man, God did a great job here. This is wonderful. Um, 
all these, all these wonders, all these signs, all the witness of God. Um, verse 4, God bears witness with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. I just put two things here. The gospel is confirmed by the witnesses to Jesus. We saw that in verse 3. And it is confirmed by a threefold witness of God. Verse number 4. You see these things. First of all, the signs and wonders. The, the Bible tells us that to the, the Jews required a sign. What the Jews are looking for, what they were looking for, is that the Old Testament prophecies would be fulfilled. And, and, and they were. They were fulfilled. The Jews were looking for a sign. And Jesus said, okay, I've fulfilled these in your presence today. Um, the, the Gentiles were looking at, for the miracles. When they saw the miracles, the non-Jewish people, and they saw Jesus do the healings and, and, and feed the people and, and, uh, uh, and, and the dead came back to life, all of these things, it spoke to the Gentile heart. And to us, it's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. To the Christian, we're conf- we confirm that, that this is all coming together because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in our presence through the Holy Spirit. Let me put it this way. Um, we sit down and we open our Bible and somebody reads the Scripture, teaches the Scripture, and all of a sudden we get the sense from the Holy Spirit Himself of what's taking place. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you try to help somebody, and it's like the Lord blesses you for helping them. And, and you just say, man, that was just such a great thing that I was able to help them. I feel so fulfilled in my spirit. That's the Holy Spirit confirming in us. Uh, all of a sudden you're looking at something you shouldn't look at, or you have a, such a terrible, sinful reaction to something, and you feel terrible and guilty, again, that's the Holy Spirit. And we understand that our God sits in heaven, sent His Son Jesus. It's confirmed. All of this truth is confirmed in us by how the Holy Spirit speaks to our inner being. And whether you call it a guilty conscience or whether you just get the pat on the back from the Lord, that's the Holy Spirit working in your, in your midst. And sometimes He enables us to say things and do things and, and give of ourselves more than we ever thought possible. That's the sign of the Holy Spirit is working in us and working through us. And, uh, and so the writer of Hebrews says, all right, here's the confirmation. God Himself, those of us who saw and, and knew Jesus Christ, and then these ways that the Lord works in our, in our midst. We know that our God, Um, sent Jesus Christ to this earth for us, and he is the better messenger. Um, So we'll look at all these things. Folks, when times get rocky, and and they possibly could, before before the rapture takes place, we could have an economic downturn. We could have spiritual persecution. We could be divided amongst from people that we love just because of persecution and you say pastor tim come on listen not too long ago um we had missionaries that were not able to go into russia go into russia and preach freely and now things are tightening down and their liberties are being taken away and the country is being turned upside down Um, I was challenged as a young man, and God wasn't in it, but somebody challenged me to go to, he said, he went to Russia to Red Square and held his Bible up and walked around Red Square with his Bible up. Five years before that, he would have been put in prison for that because they they had to smuggle Bibles in. And then all of a sudden, freedom broke out. And now it seems the window is closing again. And who are we to think that it couldn't happen to us? And if things get really bad, what are you going to hold on to? The book of Hebrews says it's doctrinal. Get a load of what Jesus has done for you and hold on to Jesus. And don't drift away. He's the anchor for your soul. He's the anchor for your life. Know what Jesus did for you. Jesus is better. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Sometimes it's just easy for me to take the things of God for granted. I don't think I'm alone on this. I can get caught up in all sorts of other things. I can think about, you know, 
news and politics and sports and business and family stuff, and there's probably a time and a place for all of those things. But it's easy for me just to kind of take Jesus for granted. And if nothing else, if we get nothing else from the book of Hebrews, let's get this. Jesus is better and demands, what did we read today? I put it in Bible terms, the, most, the more earnest heed, the most careful, deliberate, intentional examination of our faith and our lives and how the Lord can impact us. And so today, I hope and pray that uh, every one of us will take an examination of our heart. How are we doing with the Lord? How are we doing with our faith? If you've done that this morning, you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, can I just simply say, I hope today before you leave this place that you know Christ. It's one thing to believe. It's another thing to put your faith in. It's the one thing to say, oh, I know Jesus you know, is God's Son. It's another thing to say, Jesus is my personal Savior. I asked Him to forgive me of my sins. I've asked Him to come into my life. I am making him the king of my life. I'm going to follow after Jesus. And if you haven't made that decision, I hope and pray you'll make that decision this day. Let's do what the Lord would have us to do. God in heaven, Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us. I pray now that you will uh, speak to us as only you can. Lord, if somebody needs to make a spiritual decision today, I pray that they would, um, before they leave, make that decision. They would come to the front. They would come find me in the back. And, um, and Lord, in just a few minutes, uh, we know the work that you can do. And I pray, Lord, that uh, something so, so serious that we just wouldn't push it aside. I pray for this church family that we would not casually um, approach you and casually approach our faith. Lord, help us to give it more than a passing glance. More than... Um, than that, but that we'll clearly, intentionally look at ourselves in light of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.